<laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the layover. Tonight, Mark gets excited about night fighters. Lindsay discusses having eight legs. And I'm going to talk about nothing for a change. Welcome to the layover live. Thank you. One life for the revolution. Good evening, everyone. How are we? Yeah, good, thanks. Evening. Yeah, just, just having seen your text, Lindsay, not impressed. But uh, I'll take that one. That was fair. Sorry, I forgot. I uh, forgot your mum was visiting. Um, I'm glad you're not going to do much chatting this evening. That's good. Yeah. That is good. Yeah. Hello, yeah. everyone. Hello, everyone listening in the future as well. Yeah. Well, so listening in the future, if you are listening in the future, don't forget to subscribe and press the like button. That's what we like. Uh, so, Mark, straight into it tonight. Uh, what's this about you and Night Fighters? Yeah, I'd also like to know about this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Guess who's 40? It is the stealth. I mean, it's very appropriate, but given our, given our guest. Um, so this was, this is the Nighthawk. I never knew it as the Nighthawk. I'm sure they invented that name afterwards. The F-115A, yeah, um, wow. which has definitely, definitely been retired, except they may still be operating. Uh, yeah, like period. they may have may have just done a full ship over Groom Lake yeah. this afternoon. Uh, so these picks are from Jamie. If you so number one, you need to check out Jamie's aviation barbecue channel, which is really cool anyway. But also, we had Jamie on this show, uh, and you ruined all his photos, Scott. So, um, but he does take a very good snap, does he not? But he, yeah, he does. I, I, I prefer Jamie's photos, the ones where the wings are cut off. Oh, yeah. Um, you yeah, see a little uh, bit of the, him dying inside every time you put one of his pictures up, and you'd ruin you it. You could see him. You could see him doing this, couldn't you? Um, yeah. I thought this picture, this particular one, was particularly cool because the a pilot of that one one seven is obviously looking at Jamie and thinking, "Should you really be taking pictures of me? Yeah. Are, you, are you allowed? <laughs> yeah, are you yeah. allowed to be taking pictures oh. of me? Yeah, what an amazing oh. airplane! What an amazing it, airplane. it is." An absolutely stunning airplane. If you you know, if you think, when was it built? Nineteen eighty three or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's forty years in service. Original, um, the original sort of technology demonstrator was a thing called Have Blue or Pave Blue or some some ridiculous name. It was the ugliest looking thing you've ever seen. Really doesn't doesn't look like it. It's uh, in the National Museum of the Air Force at Wright Patterson. Um, uh, but yeah, it's um, uh, quite amazing. I do have some numbers about it, but I just find it overall an amazing looking airplane. So, you know, many... oh, sorry, go on. You go. I was going to say, how, how many were built? Do you know? Uh, I'd have to look it up. Not many, not a huge number uh, by American 59. standards. Oh, no, 64. 64. That's a tiny oh. number, actually. Bearing in mind how expensive it would have been to uh, to develop, I imagine that you know yeah. the cost per unit would be pretty about pretty high. Well, do you guys know where all this stealth technology came from? No. no. Well, it's, it's obviously a secret, being you know yeah, stealth, I but it was. See it. So it was a Soviet. It was a Soviet paper that was published. Ah yes, yes. I, rem I, I do. I remember now something about this. Was this not some? Uh, and they found it published in some library somewhere the americans took it and used yeah. it to build an airplane that inevitably the russians could have had years before but ignored this guy i can't remember his name now yeah um, but, it, but uh, they said basically it was uh, you could do this but it would be unflyable because nobody would ever have computers powerful enough to make this thing fly and then the americans made a computer yeah, that was what? powerful yeah. enough to make it fly amazing amazing stuff uh, allegedly the f-22 with its low observability uh, retired the 117, but it is still flying around, probably for uh, aggressor type work. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's based it's at awesome. based at Tornapar, based at Tornapar, isn't it? Uh, I've seen them flying around. Sounds brilliant. And I mean, I look at the I look at the pictures, and they still look futuristic. 
and it's hard to fathom that you know that was back in the 80s that was mm. happening mm. even mm. today it still looks you know kind i of know it. Could you imagine driving down the highway between Vegas and Tonopah and that thing flying across the top of you? You can see why that became the alien highway, didn't you? You know, it, yeah. it would, you'd just think that's something out of this planet. You'd have another one of these, wouldn't you? Anyway, <laughs> um, so what else we got going on? Pre-flight inspections. Hey. Oh, go on. The benefit of doing a thorough pre-flight. Scott, play the video. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be laughing. I would not be laughing either. So I, think it it end up. It, I think it ended up on the floor and he shouted, it's not going to bite you. I don't care. Anything that's that size, I not a chance. I've not watched that video several times and it has frightened the life out of me every single time. I've decided I'm not very good with spiders. Um, but there we are. There we are. Um, did you, um, Scotty, is there Go any... On. Any history with you and a snake in an aeroplane? Have you actually been snakes on a plane? Is that you? I had a rock python come out of some freight on a C-130 once. Um, we picked up this freight in Nairobi, stuck it on the back. It had been sat out on the apron all night, just stuck it on the back. We got airborne to go off to Cyprus. Um, and in the on the descent into Cyprus, when we pulled the power back, this rock python which was about 15 foot long fell onto the floor next to some passengers who were sitting next to the freight um at the time at the time i didn't know that a rock python wasn't ven venomous um but it, when a 15 foot snake lands on your lap and you're sitting there just waiting to go to cyprus i tell you what it uh, there was a few a few very hard men weren't very hard for a very very short period when it was screaming <laughs> like screaming like little kids when this thing landed on the lap yeah <laughs> and you really saying funny. don't worry it's just my that's just my rock python that's a lovely shall, talk. yeah hello uh, so scotty tell me but why are you not going to why are you not going to talk much this evening um i'm not going to offer a pre pre guest story tonight because i'm so excited about our guest i want to get him on and chat to them about the new book tornado in the eye of the storm if you haven't read this, if you haven't ordered it or got it for Father's Day, now is the chance to get it. Um, I guess this evening, described as a national hero, um, but like so many other true heroes, and I can see him in the green room shaking his head, um, he'll always insist he merely survived through adversity, not really recognising his selfless contribution to the nation. Um he served in the RAF for 15 years on active duty in the first Gulf War in 1991. Uh, his tornado was shot down and they were captured. Uh, him and his uh, pilot, John, uh, another John, uh, were held prisoners of war, including um, being paraded on television. That particular act provoked worldwide condemnation uh, as our guest image was projected into the homes uh, across the world and all over the newspapers. Now, a best-selling author uh, of highly acclaimed uh, Second World War epics such as Spitfire and Lancaster, our guest's latest release, released the title this week, Tornado in the Eye of the Storm, which chronicles the story of the RAF's tornado force uh, at the heart of Operation Desert Storm, back in for the liberation of Kuwait back in 1991. Welcome in this evening's guest, Joe Nicol. Welcome to the lane. Oh, crap. Oh, sorry. I did, you didn't tell me that was going to be. That's I normally me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I give you a fun fact before we start about F-117s? Yes. Sure. They nearly killed me and all of the prisoner of, of war in the uh, Mukha Barrett headquarters in Baghdad. That section in the book where we described the prison being bombed, four, yeah. uh, they dropped four two thousand pound bombs on the building we were in. Wow! Never, never wow. like, never liked them since. Not your favourite airplane. I, I apologise for bringing it up. It's fine. I was speaking to one of the guys that uh, that was shot down in the, at F one seventeen 
uh, a, a week ago about something else that I'm doing. Because obviously they're meant to be unshootdownable, right to the point where the Serbians discovered how to shoot them down. Yeah, disappointing. That must be a disappointing moment to find that out. <laughs> In his hundred million dollar jet. Yeah, very yeah. good. Well, in fact, I think, you know, Lindsay was talking about the scientist. He also wrote the same, another paper, which told you how you could actually detect yeah. the uh, the 117. Uh, and both papers were there for anybody to read yeah. for old many, many years. Old technology can defeat the newest technology. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's a story brilliant. for another day. Welcome. Welcome, okay. welcome, welcome, John. Welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Right. Thanks for having me, Mark, Lindsay. Lovely to, to meet you, albeit virtually. Scotty. Entirely average to see you again, my friend. Yes, uh, uh, we would actually we were just talking about you last week, actually, when we were having a little reminisce and walk down, uh, uh, um, uh, looking at what we've done in our careers. Uh, yeah. And I brought up some pictures of a TV program, John, that we did many, many yeah. years ago called Eight Minutes, which was uh, for BBC, I think it was. Yeah. Um, it was amazing, Re uh, and I never forget those days. It was really good fun when we and ended at some up. Point, you must tell the story of when you were doing your um, uh, first responder stuff that I came to film for. Good, uh, well, it would have been GMTV, I think it was probably then that I did that. Um, and we were sitting in a car park in a garage when you got a call. Do you remember what we did? Do you remember what happened to the cups of coffee on the uh, on the roof of the oh. car? Oh, I do. I do. And then I, I also remember the story when we were driving home and uh, we were going back to, it was RAF Lineham at the time, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we were going down a country lane and we met these girls standing in the middle of the road and, and they'd launched... In the middle of a, a, on, in a, wrapped around, was it a tree or a lamppost or something like that? A lamppost. That? Yeah, they, they'd launched themselves off the this corner into a lamppost about five, six feet in the air. It was not a scratch on them. It was amazing. So, But we're here to talk about your book, not about come us. On, come on. <laughs> Imagine those two girls. I thought, brilliant, helps arrive. Help, helps and then here. Scott. <laughs> Seriously, Lindsay, honest, no, no, but honestly, so they, and it had just happened. And this car was literally, you know how you see the pictures where the front end is wrapped around a tree or a lamppost or whatever it was. And there's uh, Scotty in a fast response car. I can't remember if you had one of the, the other team in another fast response car and me with a film crew. And so they, they, these girls are standing there, oh, my God. And it had only happened about a minute before, and they thought some, the emergency service had arrived because all the, they, we saw this steaming wreck, and all the blue lights came on, and they start the guy, they, their team all piled out and started to run in and put the bloody flames out. All this kind of crap. And I got out with a camera crew and we were filming it. It was like something from a drama series. <laughs> Left them with a completely unrealistic expectation yeah, of what, exactly. what will happen we next time. We only dialed 999 30 seconds ago. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put right, us back. Everyone the, focus. I'm gonna put us back yeah. on the straight and narrow, and I'm gonna kick yeah. off with tonight's questions. Cool. Um, so John, one thing that's really interesting about all of our guests is that oh. everybody seems to have their unique pathway into aviation. So, can you give us an insight into yours? Uh, yeah, I grew up in ju uh, just outside Newcastle. Um, I w I went to school in Newcastle itself. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to a grammar school um, and I knew that I didn't want to stay on after I got my O-levels. I wanted to do something technical. I loved electronics. I loved building burglar alarms and things like that. We're talking about the 1970s now. I'm that old. Um, uh, and I applied for a bucket of apprenticeships um, when I was 15 in 1979. Uh, and my brother was in the Air Force. He was a, an engineer. And he said, you should think about joining the Air Force. And so I kind of looked at the options. I'd been for a, an interview with what was called then the Central Electricity Generating Board. None of the, it basically was the, I don't know, what, the, uh, the, whole, the, the whole electrical infrastructure of the UK for an apprenticeship. I was waiting for the bus to go home. I was 15 and the bus stop was outside the RAF careers office uh, when they had RAF careers offices kind of on the, the high street. Yeah. I wandered in to get something to read on the bus home uh, and I signed up that day wow. <laughs> because you just did. You could do all of that kind of stuff then. I just kind of signed up for nine years. 
Uh, so yeah. I did training as a technician. I was lucky enough to do, I have a fantastic first part of my career. I made the dizzy heights of corporal uh, in the Royal, in Her Majesty's Royal Air Force. I did a huge amount of work with Scotty's old gang on Hercules. I was on a unit called Tactical Communications Wing. So we spent, this is the wake of the Falklands conflict. So we spent every waking moment preparing for the next out of area operation. And I must have spent, I God, uh, we just spent every weekend at 250 feet at low level in a Hercules puking into buckets before being thrown <laughs> off the back uh, after a tactical landing on a Kievel, Watton, these kind of dispersed air bases. And I saw all of this going on and I thought, I could do that. I could be an officer. I could fly. Uh, and I applied. I wasn't good enough to be a pilot. Due deference to the pilots amongst us today. Uh, so I became a tornado navigator. And that is it in a nutshell. Wow. Uh, and was there, was there someone who sort of said, actually, John, I think you, you've got, yeah. you, you know, someone sort of helping you along, the, giving yeah. you a little shove. Everyone seems to have a person. I was well, really, they? really. So first of all, the unit I was on, Tactical Communications Wing, was not a standard RF unit. It was uh, much more relaxed. I we, we, we were based with our officers. So we, we had uh, two, sorry, three in the end uh, officers, all of whom had been former airmen themselves and had got commission from the ranks and I worked I would work really closely we were in the, we were just in the same office every single day as a corporal and my kind of uh, three flight lieutenants uh, and they said they, they all said John you've got to go and try this don't you'll regret it forever if you don't give this if you fail it's fine but if you don't give this a go you'll regret it forever uh, and I did and hey that was it so, John, I, I know you said you weren't good enough to be a pilot there, um, but was that your aspiration when you applied? Did oh, yeah. you think, I, I, I want to be a pilot, and did you want to go back to Hercules, or was it fast no. jets always going to be your thing? No. no, no, I definitely, I remember, and I remember, still remember, I've still got this image in my head, in the RF careers office in Newcastle in 1979. So the sergeant recruiter said, uh, young, young John, what do you want to do? I said, oh, I, I want to be a technician, but I, I really would like at some point in the future to be an officer. And he said, why? I said, I said well, uh, and I want to fly. He said, why? I said, well, and I said, because every senior rank in the Air Force is air crew. So the chief of the air, ev almost everybody above one star had either a wing or two wings on their chest. And I knew that that was the only way to progress. And that was my ambition at first, to really kind of go as far as I could. And when I applied out, these were, you know, back up. So I applied in 1984 or 85, something like that. Um, and you go through all the tests, as you know. And they said, look, you just kind of don't have the aptitude to be a fast jet pilot. You could start multi-engine training this is no disrespect to you sky they could you could start it but we don't know if you get through it but you could be a fast jet navigator if you get through it. and so that was it it kind of to me it didn't make a huge amount of difference i just wanted to uh to be an officer is that that's i wanted to be an officer rather than to fly if that made sense i i loved sure. the flying but it was never i was never one of those people that kind of was uh the flying was everything to me it was about kind of moving on yeah, yeah. And, and, it's, and and that's pretty fascinating before i i'm going to ask the like we're going to get into the books uh and specifically your 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 latest book in a second but is navigator a very good description of it because other air forces use different terms yeah. You're not really finding the way. You're operating the jet tactically. Is that right? Um, well, I mean, now that it's, first of all, I don't think uh, – I think the Americans probably still have weapons systems officers uh, yeah. in the back seats of, what, uh, Strike Eagles and F-80Ds or something, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but very few people have got kind of that anymore. So Navigator was a, is certainly a misnomer now. But back then it wasn't. You know, on a Hercules, there was literally a navigator with a, a set of charts and a, a pencil and a, a, a sextant. And a, a sextant, yeah. And a, what do you call the Dalton's computer? Yeah. Um, and when I did my training, that's what you did. You know, you, you went through, you did uh, manual track plot and yeah. Dalton computer and drift and all that. So it wasn't then. And on tornadoes, you were certainly at navigator. You planned the route. You planned the 
uh, ingress, egress. So it wasn't, it became much more of a weapon systems operator as, <laughs> as, the, as the jet moved on and the systems improved. Yeah, okay, that's really, that is really interesting. I just thought I'd, but yeah, you, but you can get stuck into Scotty about being a, being a truckie as much as you like. Um, so look, <laughs> So your your new book is called Tornado in the Eye of the Storm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic. I'm reading it at the moment. I haven't finished it yet. So, uh, and this is not your personal experience. So your personal experience is in your other book, one of your other books, uh, which is Tornado Down, which I recommend everyone to get ho get a get hold of a copy. Um, after reading after reading Tornado in the Eye of the Storm, after or reading. Lancaster or Spitfire, because oh, yeah, any, just any of them. I've got a dog to feed. I've got everything. I need people to buy the books. So, um, but but this is a book about, and I, I said this in the sort of preamble when we were having a chat. This is a book about the people. It's a it's a a book about the aeroplane, the people, the tornado force, uh, and everything that makes that whole machine kind of uh, move on. But um, can we just sort of start with your own kind of Gulf War journey, sort of where you were, when the phone rang? Was it was this the war you trained for? You know, put us in that place. Uh, well, I think that <clears throat> important to say that from a personal perspective, when I joined in 81, the notion of going to war was so remote uh, because it would have been that it was the Cold War. And lots of people will not really remember that kind of when East and West Germany uh, was the dividing line of Europe when there was a, a literal iron curtain uh, across Germany with the Soviets on one side and the Western powers on the other, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. And so going to war was, uh, on, on that level, was just unrealistic for us. Um, yes, there'd been the Falklands. Yes, there was Northern Ireland. and there were, But the notion of a mass battle, especially in the tornado, you know, the tornado was it was primarily uh, it, its main role, really, after trying to hold back the Soviet hordes for 24 hours, was tactical nuclear strike. So mm. our day-to-day -day training was um, attack ops with JP-223 unguarded weapons. But our the role that we trained for endlessly and were tested on endlessly to the you know you know what it's like in a sim you know you've got to tick everything correct the str the nuclear strike role you could not you could not get the color of a letter wrong or you and it was it was it was real trouble if you got anything wrong and so that's what we trained to do and the notion of go doing that in a tornado was not realistic and then the cold war became a warm war the iron curtain was drawn off to one side uh, and we didn't know what we were going to do. We actually thought that, you know, there may be no need for the military after 1989. Really, you know, we really did think this is we're just going to disband. And then Iraq invaded Kuwait in August 1990 uh, and everything took off. And it was the most astonishing time to be involved. I would I would be lying if I didn't see it was exciting. We were like firefighters that had never been to a fire. We were like medics who'd never be to a car accident. And suddenly somebody said, you're going to go and take this thing and do it for real. And that was an astonishing feeling. You know, nobody had ever done it. Nobody had ever flown the tornado for one single second in combat. We had a couple of people that had been in the vault Bol in the Falklands, but 99.99% of tornado operators had no combat experience. Mm. And to be involved like that was bloody exciting. Yeah. Slightly fearful but in general we didn't really i don't think we fully appreciated what we were going to go up against uh which comes out in the book on the first night when people yeah. did see what they were going up against and, and, uh we didn't we, we were trained in the tactics against radar tactics against missiles tactics against hostile jets but that first night oh my god and can i say that very first the the opening chapter it it feels a lot more like uh, the dams raid yeah. than it does about uh, you know like some very modern clinical kind of warfare. It's tra it's incredibly exciting. It's tracer bullets and and stuff coming at you and radar si systems lighting up and so on. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> and and John, like you said, that the tornado was an unproven platform yeah. operating in that kind of environment. Did you have any concerns about the capability of the jet or were you just totally sort of 
ignorance is bliss and unaware what the missions would be? I, I mean, I, I'm not even sure, Lindsay, I would say ignorance is bliss because we didn't, we, nobody knew what the AAA, the anti-aircraft artillery, the flak, the bullets coming up from the ground, nobody knew what that was going to be like. And we were really prepared. We were really highly trained. I mean, we, we, we were, you know, we'd been training by January 1991. Most of the crews had been flying together for the best part of six months, training at low level, so down to 30 feet, maybe 540 knots, six, 600 knots, something like that. Most, and at night, and this is pre-night vision goggles. This is pre-anything like that. This, is, this was old fashioned terrain following radar. So the pilots sitting, as you, you know, I don't, I'm not demeaning, sitting with their hands on their laps at 200 feet in total darkness as the jet went across the desert at, uh, in the darkness at, well, 540, sometimes 600 knots. No, 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 nothing at all. And when, you know, the first time people were locked up the, with missiles, the first time people uh, were kind of facing hostile fire, they were doing missile breaks at kind of at 200 feet in the dark in formation with the rain, but you can't see anybody else. There's no, there's no avoidance other than the big sky theory. Uh, so you know, people were crossing at night 15 feet above each other's cockpits in missile breaks in the darkness. But we have complete confidence but nobody knew what the AAA was going to be like. And that was the, that really caused some massive problems. Wow. So John, in that first bit of the book, um, it, you explain the, the fear, the trepidation as you're walking out for the first mission. You've lived that as well. Yeah. Um, what did it feel like when you were um, walking from, from the briefing yeah. to the plane? What went through your mind? I can still remember it now. I, so we were, John Peters and I were the first daylight ride. So my mates that I write about in the first part, they'd just come back doing the first ever live combat tornado mission and their eyes were like that. Um, and I still can see Paddy Cheekel, my mentor on the squad who looked after me. And it, it, Paddy's a big man, brave man, uh, an icon in the Air Force, an icon on the squad. And, and he was like, his eyes were like that. And he went, effing hell he, uh, he said i've never seen anything like it it was like he said i think its words were something like tubes of molten explosive metal and you just it was just there it was like a wall and then pat um buck as my flight commander said but don't worry john you'll be okay <laughs> so we walked, <laughs> yeah. we, so we walked past them as they came in and there was an absolute sense of, I'm going to say trepidation rather than fear, uh, and a, but a real sense of excitement. There, are, there was a real sense of excitement uh, because we were going to do the job. We were about to go to our first ever fire as firefighters, and it was bloody exciting. It was amazing to be part of. You know, you, there were, I think on the first 24 hours, there was two and a half thousand jets in the sky, and it was just astonishing to be part of this. Two and a half thousand jets. Yeah, yeah. I think it was in the first twenty-four hours. All squeezed together. Yeah. Yeah, Well, but so at night it was coordinated by you go over there at five thousand feet, you go over there at four, you guys fly across the border at two hundred feet, we'll go over at five hundred feet. The helicopters will be over there, hovering at a hundred feet. But there's no nobody's. Yes, AWACS was there. There was lots going on, but nobody. There was no real deconfliction other than the the battle plan that said you're over there, you're over there, you're there, you're there, because you can't see anybody else. Just kind of do your thing. Be careful. Yeah. Wow. And I guess I guess it's worth uh, it's worth reflecting. And I've you know I mentioned that it feel like the sort of dams raid. It's got that very yeah. sort of Second World War uh type of feel that 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 opening chapter but it is worth worth refre- reflecting on you know, there were i think it was 11 tornadoes lost um i think it was 12 was it 12 air crew lost their lives there was 11 jets lost in training before the war oh. and uh, so sorry sorry in total so 11 in, jets in including training the training and in the conflict so there was Six jets lost in Iraq, one to a technical failure, and we had one, four lost in training before the war. Uh, 
two two mid-air collisions because again no you know this was kind of 250 feet over the north sea bit of haze kind of people coming in opposite directions never saw each other three people killed in that uh a night time uh we call them a loft the americans would refer to as a toss maneuver where you yeah. kind of pull up from 100 feet uh and the the computer kind of releases the bombs to arc onto the target and the guys kind of you have to you do 135 degrees angle of bank in the dark right. uh from 600 knots at about 1300 feet and then you you basically are diving back down from you pull up from 100 feet 135 degrees angle of bank pull back down uh and uh one one team flew into the sea doing that we lost another nearly lost a number of aircraft doing it for real so they were uh a number of uh different uh accidents that one that you've just put up that's slightly controversial <laughs> oh, really oh yeah no no it's fine it's this is all that was uh somebody coming back to tabuk in saudi arabia uh if i remember correctly and somebody somewhere had put the approach end barrier up which would never be up for fast jet ops Oh, so okay. the approach end barrier, and I, I don't know, kind of, does that translate into civvy speak, you guys? Uh, the, the big, basically, the net that would you would there's only used in an emergency, and you put it on the the opposite end. But that's somebody put the approach end barrier up at night without telling anybody at Tabuk, uh, and that their their undercarriage caught in it as they came into land, and so they basically coming into land undercarriage course they basically smash down onto the runway the jet snaps in half and they bang out as you can see and that's just race basically rolled along the uh, run I, I, and i guess you know the, the question i have is that i sus i suspect that the the rate of loss you know, the speed and the kind of cumulative loss rate was probably something that wasn't really in living memory in the air force at the time and and did did that did that have an effect on morale? Did it dampen that initial enthusiasm or, or did it harden resolve? How did it feel? Uh, both. So first of all, Mark, I wasn't there. Uh, yeah. So I was sitting on my fat backside in Baghdad uh, yeah. after the first nine, you know, so I wasn't there. But obviously I interviewed a load of people right from some of the most senior officers um, and uh, Sir so John Major, I'd spoken to about kind of what it was like to be there. Uh, some of the senior officers and the guys who were still flying the jets. Uh, and after the first three days, the losses, I think it's important to say that we, ex I think, in my memory, we expected quite a lot of losses. Mm -hmm. And so, when, as, and I really remember this. So we sent from my base, so we sent eight jets on the first mission and each each big tornado base set, i think sent eight jets and when mm. we got the message back on the first night that every single jet had come back safely i was astonished because nobody expected it nobody expected everybody to come back from the first stop uh, but then when jets started to go down the strain mm. did begin to show and I, I speak to my old boss and he said you know kind of on the third night uh, when people were really kind of thinking, this is bad. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep flying into this hail of gunfire and expect to come home. Uh, and everybody, people have forgotten that everybody was at low level, or most people were at low level on the first, uh, probably the first three days. It wasn't just the tornadoes. The B-52s were at low level. What's the wingspan of a B-52? What is it, 185 feet? Yeah. They were flying in to their targets at 50 feet in a b-52 again yeah. no no night vision goggles this is kind of rad out uh looking kind of hoping that you could see a little bit type thing um and so the the strain did begin to show there's no doubt about it in the first three days and tactics change quite quickly yeah yeah i know scotty's gonna pop yeah i'm gonna t i'm gonna talk about you sitting on your ass in baghdad uh, as you <laughs> so cunningly put it a second ago john at us. Uh, yeah, um, we all know. We, 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 I'm sure we all remember the, these these images. That it, you won't remember them, John, because you were, uh, as you say, oh. living it at the time. Um, you've gone over the target. You've been hit by the AAA. Um, you've ejected from your tornado, uh, which must have been a relief because you were alive. 
um, in many ways. But what did it feel like landing on the ground and knowing the game's up, the enemy are going to come and get me? It's almost un it's almost unbelievable. It's so many stages during that experience. It's like looking at this massive uh, vertical cliff, this mountain in front of you, and thinking, I can't do that. This is a nonsense now. I can't, but you can't do anything other than deal with uh, what life has put in front of you. And sitting in the desert with my pilot John Peters was laughable. And I don't, and I don't say that. it was literally. We laughed because it was so unreal. You know, we, we none of this was meant to happen this way. You know, I mean, it just wasn't. Um, the attack had gone wrong, and you know, there'd been I'd made a mistake on the, the attack run. We, the, so the bombs hadn't come off. We'd been shot down a couple of minutes later in an unrelated incident. But it was just unreal. Uh, we were on the run for about three hours before we were captured. Uh, you know, bit of, there was kind of a bit of gunfire, a bit of kind of battling going on. <laughs> we had a, what weapon did you carry, Scott? Did you have a, a 9 mil? The SL, yeah, the little SLP. Uh, so we, yeah, well, so we, no, but we had a... Uh, um, 7.62 is it uh walther pp so a james bond thing which is literally like it's, it's almost like a little <laughs> pathetic little thing and so we had our little walthers out while they've got i don't know a dozen ak-47s and a spray and a swift it's like being in a cowboy movie you know you know the cowboys mo movies you used to watch where bullets whiz past your head and bits of sand are being thrown up around you. The, the cactus plant is being torn apart. It's literally like that. And it's well, and one, it's kind of terrifying. Don't get me wrong, but it's also unreal. And being captured, and being dragged off to Baghdad, and then three days of really quite violent and brutal interrogation. But you showed those pictures, Scott. For me. That was the worst moment of my whole experience. So clearly, I had no idea that those pictures would be flashed around the world, mm -hmm. but I know that they were filming. And they said they'd beaten seven bells out of us. Uh, they'd kind of, you know, I'd had cigarettes stubbed out. We had a tissue paper stuffed out, stuffed down my neck and uh, set on fire to, to kind of give in to the whole thing. And then that broadcast, uh, that uh, notion of being paraded on TV was awful. For me, it was a humiliation. Something that I still regret. Something those so those the the broadcasts I think went on for about a minute, a minute and a half, two minutes, and I've never watched them in thirty years. I've never ever ever watched that broadcast because it's for me it was an, uh, an indication of failure. Everything that I'd done had gone wrong, and I remember being in, in after they so they said if you don't do it we're going to kill you. They've got put a gun against my head type thing, uh, and so I did it trying to be as uh, under duress as I could be and I was in tears afterwards I was lying on a concrete floor uh, hands handcuffed behind my back a bandage uh, to, wrapped around my head so I could see and I was crying because I felt so humiliated at having done it hmm. wow and and John sort of how did you how long were you held for and, and how how did your release come about how did that happen and and what emotions you know did you feel when you knew that you were going to be safe again. Uh, it was a roller coaster, Lindsay. It really was. You know, it was seven. I think we were held captive. I think seven weeks, forty-seven days, something like that. We'd been through. Uh, we'd been nearly killed on a couple of occasions. Uh, we'd had mock executions. We'd been starved. I lost two stone in five weeks. Uh, my good lady wife says I should be popping back quite quickly. To be perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> We were held in Abu Ghraib. We were we were nearly killed in the secret police headquarters in Baghdad when it was bombed. And then when they kind of released us, it was so emotional, so unbelievable to be landing back in Saudi Arabia uh, to be met by uh, General Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, by uh, senior RAF officers. Uh, by the crown prince of Saudi, and th but more importantly, and I, I may well cry when I say this, by our mates who were there to meet us. So they'd yeah. sent kind of some trusted friends, mm. and for me, it was just the most incredible emotion. It really was. Uh, so that's me and uh, Rupert Clark. That's where we got back to, to Larbrook. 
uh, and we're being kind of interviewed by the media. <laughs> I'm just getting my arms folded 30 years old. Uh, <laughs> but, but kind of going back to Saudi and seeing our friends was the most astonishing experience because it kind of, it just happened so, all that seven weeks of hell that you would never wish, wish on your worst enemy. But it kind of happened quite quickly as well. And I think I was prepared for seven months, seven years of captivity because we didn't know what was going to happen. Right. right. Yeah. It, was all, it was all over really quite quickly. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well. John, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move on now. Uh, uh, and we're going to talk about Tornado in the Eye of the Storm. Uh, thank you for the copy, <laughs> by the way. Another beautifully crafted book. Um, takes us inside, as Mark said, inside the Tornado Force uh, in what was the greatest operational challenge. I think everybody will, will agree on that. Um, I've never flown a fast jet, as you know. I was a truckie. Not, really uh, not really good enough, though, were you? I wasn't really good enough for fast jets. Uh, and you know you know, I didn't like going upside yeah. down. I yeah. I'm the only person in the world who passed the aerobatics test on instruments. I <laughs> absolutely hated that. But I was... <laughs> Genuinely, I was transported here. Uh, you know, I was involved in this, but I was transported here and taken inside the cockpit um, w with the book, particularly on the first night of operations. Um, what I'm trying to ask you is, how difficult is it get to get now people to share those deep emotions with you? How do you? And I know a lot of these people are your friends anyway, mm. but. Um, it must be very difficult to share some of the stuff that you've shared with us tonight, but but also getting them to share that as well. How do you get them to do it, John? Uh, I, th I think probably trust Scott. Um, so I've done this many times before with Lancaster and Spitfire, but then I've been interviewing 90-year-old men and women about their experiences. I have never done it like this way with my closest friends that we'd never spoken about the whole thing before. We had shared the odd story, the odd ditty. Uh, even people that I was a prisoner of war with, I'd never really spoken to them. Uh, something quite strange uh, happened. Um, we have uh, the prisoners of war who, and again, the tornado force was so massive. We had, I think in 1990, we had something like 2,000 frontline aircraft and 430 tornadoes. 430. I think the RAF has now got about 500 aircraft in total. We had 430 tornadoes. So you didn't know that many people. You knew your own squadron and not that many other people. So I did not know almost every one of the prisoners of war until they appeared at various stages in crappy locations in Baghdad. <laughs> and I really didn't know. We became great friends. Uh, but we never spoke about it. And for me, trying getting their stories i really had I, this book uh imposed on me a, a level of trust that i've not experienced before because i people were trusting me with stories that whilst they're 30 years old were deeply personal deeply the loss of friends uh the loss of family uh the loss of loved ones the the emotions of the families at home when you hear the the steps on the pathway at one o'clock in the morning and you know when that doorbell goes or there's a knock on the door at one o'clock in the morning only bad news is about to arrive yeah. only bad news and so yeah. that trust was really important and i i've had quite a few uh, quite a few emails and texts from friends and you know people don't praise it you, you know nobody would but i think uh one of the one stars who said today uh it's a, it's, it's it's quite good. It's quite good. That's good, isn't it? That's, uh, I, I saw that. I saw that comment yeah, today from Al. Actually, yeah. Yeah, Al Byford. Uh, so Al was there's a young pilot. Um, uh, a couple of my mates, uh, Nigel Risdale, who's a major character in the book. He said, "Well, he said, I first of all, thank you, but I didn't know he didn't know most of the story." And the, the point about the book is that it's bringing all of those stories together. So yeah, I'm quite, quite proud of it. John, I've got a little quote here because you know one of the things you touch on the parents, um, and this is from um, Dave Waddington's parent. Yeah. Uh, it says there was a knock on the door at one a.m. I opened it to see two men in smart blue uniforms, accompanied by a priest, and they asked, yeah. "Are you the are you the parents of Flight Lieutenant David Waddington?" 
and I knew then it would be bad news, very bad news. Uh, I mean, it, it's an extraordinary, as a parent, you know, very difficult, yeah. thing, a difficult thing to read, um, let alone experience. Uh, I, presumably, you know, you there must have been a similar knock for, yeah. for the Michael yeah. family. Yeah, there was. Look, that knock on the door has happened in so many different conflicts. It was a tele. It was in the old days. It was a telegram. Sorry, you know, in the World War Two. Um, uh, sorry to say that your your loved one uh, something is, is missing in action on operations over Germany. It was done slightly better. Or it was done much better in the in the Gulf War. But mm. and it's happened so many times since. You know, we've got Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and that knock on the door is something that so many people fear and a couple of things uh for me the imagery in the that comes out is somebody either somebody opens their curtains on the first morning mm -hmm. and looks out and the station commander so this the, the most senior person on the, the the base their car drives up black car it was always a black cavalier or whatever but then uh drives up and stops outside a neighbor's house and you know what that means. Mm. You know that somebody is getting the knock at the door. And mm. a couple of people, uh, uh, Chris Ankerson, whose husband was shot down on the fourth or fifth day, uh, six o'clock in the morning, knock at the door, puts her dress again on, comes down and there's a turn on the landing and she looks out the little window and there's a black car. And she said, I know what that is. Mm. Um, uh, Bill Green, who was killed uh, in training before the war, uh, he was a group captain, uh, but he was still the boss of 27th Squadron. His wife could hear the door knocking at two o'clock in the morning mm. and looked through the security hole. And the station commander, Jock Stirrup, who went on to be uh, the chief of the defense staff, Jesus. he was the station yeah. commander. Yeah. Jock is standing outside in full dress uniform. She knows him, they're friends, she knows him. She won't open the door. She won't open the door. So she sits back on the stairs. And when you hear things like that, the reality of what it meant, there's two wars being fought. There's a war being fought on the front line and there's a war being fought at home. One of, I'm going to boy, uh, Kirsty Stewart. Uh, so Robbie Stewart's daughter, Kirsty went on to be a tornado pilot herself and the first female uh, RF for an hour. Kirsty was 13 when her dad was shot down. And she was at home with her brother uh, when her dad was shot down about 10 o'clock at night. Her mum had, was at a neighbor's house. And she said, she described I would be in tears again. And she could hear walking up the back path. And it was par RAF parade shoes. So, because mm. you've got your best uniform on, you put your parade shoes on, and they've got metal tips in them. Mm. And she said, I could hear this click, 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 click. Come, and she knew what it was, 13. And she said when she joined the Air Force, that caused her real problems every time she went on parade. Yeah. yeah. Per click, 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 click. That's mm. the reality. And, and John, when you sort of um, speak to people about these recollections and when you, you know, write them down, sort of how do you how do you manage those emotions and what must have been, you know, still a very difficult time in, in your life as well? Um, it was... It was really tricky. We had, uh, honestly, I, I, all the people that I interviewed, I reckon, so I, all the people I interviewed, so what is it, a dozen, 50, 20 people in the book, the, for the main characters, at some point in the course of the interview, the interviewee and I were in tears. But I had to do it 20 times. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so at some point we're all, oh my God, do you remember? Yes, oh my God, do you remember Steve Hicks when he was killed? Oh my God, that was terrible. But I had to do that 20 times. Wow. And it, every single person at some point became really emotional when they remembered all everything that had gone on. Uh, but that's, that's what creates a brilliant story. That's what tells the story of what it was like, I hope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, and it genuinely does. I mean, that's... That's the place I've been transported to, as you say. These two battlefronts, the the, the desert, and and back at home, you know, as you say, with with people watching folk come up the path and tell them the bad news. Amazing, 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 amazing. Uh, John, can I just go back and ask a question? Um, now, I read in the 
book, or you may have said it in another interview, that there's something around an old World War II rule that existed at the time, that if you were either a prisoner of war or, or deceased, the, the, the Ministry of Defence, RAF, stopped the wages of the individual going to the wife. Is that correct? Or Absolutely. I talk, uh, it happened to uh, a number. So I talk about Chris Ankerson, whose husband was shot, Bob was shot down, uh, uh, and Robbie Stewart's wife, Tange. Uh, so, so Chris was the one who kind of seen the black car coming up and the so she was told on day, you know, kind of day four, your husband's missing in action. We have no idea what's going to happen to him. We have no idea if he's alive or dead. And nobody had any information. So there were a number of, there were a lot of us listed as missing in action. Not everybody came home. And for the wives, and it was obviously all wives or parents back then, everybody lived in fear for seven weeks. But after, I think after three or four days after her husband was shot down, Dusty Miller, who went on to be a Force three star, I think, uh, it was the squadron commander came back and said, Chris, I've got some bad news for you. And she went, oh, my God, is he dead? And it wasn't. She, he said, uh, the RAF stopping your pay. Sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, because because when you're in the World War II regulations, this is 1991, state that if you're missing in action, you, kinda, you can't have your flying pay anymore. And that's quite a big chunk of your uh, – so literally the squadron commander – and the the wife of somebody who doesn't know if she's if her husband's alive or dead on the floor with a bill saying, right, I can't pay the electricity this month because there's not enough in the account, but I can pay the mortgage on the house because we've still got a house. And they were having this conversation. And not only that, and Lindsay, this is gonna get you really going. Not only that, not only was she not going to be paid his full wage, she wasn't to be trusted with any money because she's a lady. And ladies what? can't be trusted <laughs> their husband's salaries. And so her salary for the duration of the war had to be paid into the RAF Bruggen administrator's account. Wow. She had to present herself <laughs> to a young corporal and say, please, can I have some of my money? Wow. That's, that, it, 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 these things were sorted out, but it, it just, it was archaic in some res in loads of respects. It was archaic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and maybe maybe you know there is a bit of a sense of that with the book that um, there's a kind of a, a turning point, you know, from the very sort of old Air Force of old, the sort of Second World War fifties type of Royal Air Force, yeah. uh, and then moving into a much more modern place yeah. with much more modern equipment, because of, of course the tornado was very much you know a, mo a modern a modern airplane. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's good to see petty-minded administration <laughs> continues continues through uh, through adversity. Um, I guess the final question for me, there's, there's, a, there's a quote from, is it Mal Craighill? Is that right? Is that Craighill, right? Yeah. And he says, he says, I enjoyed the war. I enjoyed it. Which, given that everything you've just told us about, seems a bit of a strange thing to say. But can you just help us kind of reconcile that statement? Uh, I completely understand it. So Mal... Uh... As a mate, they're actually they're on a they're cycling 690 miles as we speak. They're on the it's, their, their Twitter is TTTE Treble TE 1991, and they're in memory of all our mates who were killed. They're cycling around every grave uh, the, over the course of this week. In actual fact, so they're they're doing that at the moment. Wow. But it was uh, it's what we wanted to do, Mark. I go back to the firefighter. I go back to the police. Uh, officer who runs into a pub fight on a Friday night and gets a punch in the face. You don't just stop doing that because you get a punch in the face. That's what you're trained to do. And yeah. so for everybody back then, the notion of doing it for real was an astonishing, astonishing thing to be part of. So Mal said, yes, we lost mates. Yes, lost close friends. But we were doing the job we trained to do. And mm -hmm. Not many people get the opportunity to do that. Not back then. Now it's different. But not many people get the opportunity to do that. Mm. Yeah, uh, that makes that does make a lot of sense. It's extraordinary. This the the raft of kind of emotions and and yeah. you know, the complexity of it really. Um, you know, for me, I was a you know I was a sixth form when it was all happening. I remember becoming angry when I saw you on the front of the newspaper. Not as bloody angry as I was. Let me tell you that. <laughs> But yeah, I, I so you say you were in sixth form. So at the end of the book, 
uh, that one of the squadron commanders who leads the final ops, uh, James Heaps, uh, was a schoolboy watching it uh, on TV. More importantly, the, the guy who dropped the final bomb, so the tornado flew on ops from 1990 all the way through to retirement in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, 30 years, nearly 30 years later. Hmm. The guy who dropped some of the last bombs of the conflict uh, of the tornado over Syria uh, and Iraq in 2019 was not born when we went to war in 1990. That's how long the story went on for. He wasn't born. Wow. It's sort of making me feel astonishing, if I'm honest. Uh, makes me feel makes me feel old because I was in the Air Force as well. Um John, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening, particularly on Armed Forces Week, beginning of yeah. Armed Forces Week. Um thanks for being a guest tonight. For me, I want to finish by just reading a small piece from the book. Um the reflection of Mike Toft, actually. Um a navigator of some 30 years, uh, his recollections after the war. He said, what makes military people serve, fight, risk their lives? It's certainly not the money or the glory. It's not really queen or country. In the end, it's your mates, standing, flying, on your left and right. They rely on you and you on them. We fight together, we celebrate together, and sometimes some of us die together. Being part of a unit with a combined purpose was incredible. I was part of a great force with some exceptional friends and colleagues, a solid team flying a solid aircraft. I was very proud to have served alongside everyone on the tornado. By the book. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. John, thank you very much for being on this evening. Um, I just want to say some of the stories, actually, that reading that almost had me in tears, but um, one of our regular viewers, John, who's a train driver, said it's taken 26 episodes, to have him in, and he's been in tears for most of it. Um, <laughs> thanks, folks. John, thank you very much for being with us this evening, uh, and all the best with the book. I'm sure it will be a, a resounding success like all the rest. Thank you, mate. Real pleasure to be with you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye, John. Nice. Thanks, John. He, he's gotten away without our constant questions. Oh, should we bring him back? Oh, we've got to bring him back. Let's let's catch him. He might. He might. Still oh, be, he oh might. God! Uh, uh, we caught him again. We caught him What's again. Um, that's my fault. I took you out before we'd done the constant questions. Can we, can we do them, John? Because they, are, I think they are. So somebody but, from the two winged master race got something wrong. I find that very difficult to believe. It's outrageous. Impossible. Impossible. It, Right, Scott, go quick. It's not wrong. It's just different um, by design. John, <laughs> looking back at uh, our uh, quick questions, looking back in your career thus far, what are you most proud of? Uh, getting commissioned, uh, definitely. So a young 16-year-old kid from a council estate in Newcastle uh, joined the Air Force, uh, became a corporal, uh, got commissioned, became an officer, and learned to be a navigator on tornadoes. I'm kind of quite proud of that. Yeah, that's, a, that's lovely. All right, John, my question. What advice would you give your 10-year-old self, knowing what you know now? Don't drink as much Stella. No. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's a 10-year-old. I'll tell you what, it's on an absolutely serious note. Um, so every now and then, and I'm going to be a bit profound, and I hope it doesn't bore people. Every now and then, life throws up some astonishing challenges. Uh, and if you'd have told 10-year-old John Nicholl the challenges and the mountain that he would face in another kind of 13 years' time, John, that young John Nicholas said, I can't do that. It's not possible for somebody to endure that. And then when you've got through it and you look back at the challenge, at the mountain that you've climbed, you kind of think, yeah, you can. We're quite resilient people. Some of my mates didn't come home, and, I'm, and that causes me great sadness. But I learned a lot about kind of coping with some pretty crappy circumstances and so i tell my 10 year old uh, self you can get through it you can okay awesome so the final question the the next five years what's in store more books what's the uh, subject matter sneak peek maybe can't give you the sneak peek but there's gonna be more books i'm kind of quite happy whatever happens i'll be fine 
to move on from Lindsay's question, I'll be fine. If it all goes wrong, I'll, what do you say to a navigator who's left the Air Force? You say, two Big Macs and a large fries, please. So <laughs> I'll be fine. I will be fine. I'll do, go and do something else. I'm lucky. Life sliding doors 30 years ago presented me with the most astonishing set of circumstances. And I'm lucky to be where I am. And if it goes wrong in five years, Mark, I'll do something else. But I'll be fine. Brilliant. Brilliant. Great answers. Yeah. John, the, the way the travel industry is going, you could be saying oh, that to pilots very yeah. soon as well. So never, uh, never uh, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I am going to say goodbye now for the final time. Bye, yeah. John. Thanks, John. John. Oh, wow, that was awesome. You finished, you, and you finished on time. I know you were so keen to finish on time. I was. Yeah. Uh, we were almost there. You ne you'd never make it. Um, uh, so next week, we, we'll get to next week. week. Not I, this one. I think I'm away. I am away. Mm. I'm not you here. are you away. Are gonna, you guys are going to have to cope on your own. Yeah. Not Good again. Luck. <laughs> Please, not again. Just the two of us. Um, actually, a bit of a difference this week is that we've got a trailer for next week. How professional is that? Next wow. week, it's Lieutenant Commander Retard, John Bolton. He's coming on to talk about flying in the Navy and his career in the industry thereafter. Um, but here's a little teaser from John. Uh, the day started pretty much as normal with a brief before dawn uh, to go down to Fitzroy to unload Galahad and Sir Tristram. Uh, we were flying low level, 30 feet, 90 knots with an undersung load. And all of a sudden, fighter jets went past us. I heard the noise and got into a hide and we immediately saw the smoke coming up from the ship. On arrival into the bay, it was uh, very clear that uh, Galahad had been attacked. She was on fire. Sir Tristram, there was no sign of any fire at that stage. We could also see survivors had managed to get into the life rafts and were being uh, looked after by a couple of aircraft that had just arrived about the same time. So we decided that as we could see able-bodied and seriously injured people on the front of the ship, on the forecastle, we decided to uh, move immediately there and start to lift them off as best we could. At this stage, uh, the fire had uh, started to engulf really the ship quite significantly. Um, there were large explosions. Uh, my crewman, Roy Eggston, looking out the back door, was in essence looking into an inferno. And at times, explosions blasted ammunition up into the sky and landed around us in the water. Um, but we managed, with the aircraft coming in one after the other, to lift all the survivors off, get them to the nearest point of land, and then later on, they were moved on to the hospital position and then onto the hospital ship later in the day. June the 8th, 1982 was a tough day and a tough day for many people that were involved, but it was part of a much wider campaign where so many things happened and so many uh, events occurred that never got the recognition. And whilst we were delighted to have played a, a minor part in the saving of life, uh, we really had to put that into perspective as we went into the battle that was to come on the amount of people that lost their lives in the fighting that was involved. So. We all look back on that as, a, as an achievement and something to look back po at positively in what was a tough time for everybody involved. Pretty Starting cool. Armed Forces Week with the Air Force, finishing with the Navy. Sounds like a winner for me. Lindsay, fly safe because I know it's a big one for you this week. Mark. Yeah. She'll be awesome. She will be awesome. Yeah. We'll talk about it when you've got it done. Good, good luck, night, everyone. Bye. Oh, Bye. yeah. We're going to need it. We're going to need good luck. Night, everyone. Don't forget to night subscribe night. and use the thumbs up if you liked it. See ya. Bye.